after all of these years, it's finally time for me to talk about Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. But according to this video evidence, I have already? I don't remember ever doing this, so clearly this must be another character dressed like me. This 80s Dan thing appears to go at it from the angle that this faux snob hates Halloween 3 because there's no Michael Myers, but by the end of it, he loves Halloween 3. Well, so much for me going that obvious route. So, I'll just start here at the very beginning to say that Halloween 3 Season of the Witch is is great. With Halloween 2 being, at the time, a definite end to the Michael Myers saga, Halloween 3 became a test to see if the series had any potential in becoming an anthology series. Set in a world where the Halloween films exist as movies, Halloween 3 was to be the start of a new format in which each film would contain its own stories and its own characters, all centered around the day of Halloween. The anthology idea came from producers Deborah Hill and John Carpenter, and the film serves as not just a dark satire on heavy consumerism around the holiday, but also a love letter to science fiction horror stories along the lines of The Twilight Zone, Night Gallery, and especially Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The movie's almost made to be one of the late-night horror films a character would watch in the movie Halloween. Science fiction writer Nigel Neal of the Quartermass series wrote a majority of the script, but would later have his name removed due to the amount of violence in the film. But John Carpenter also did uncredited rewrites, with the main screenplay credit going to director Tommy Lee Wallace, his first film as a director, then off of being art director and production designer for the original Halloween. So, given that this was the only standalone in the franchise, uh, uh, I guess, uh, sorta, it's hardly the only veer off on a detour, you can probably imagine what the reception and receipts were like in 1982, but we'll get to that later. Until then, let's have some fun watching Halloween 3, and don't forget about the big giveaway at 9. <laughs> it's a copy of Beverly Hills Chihuahua 3, cause I hate kids! John Carpenter and Alan Howarth, who both did music on Halloween 2, returned to do the music on this film, and you can tell... Because the music is so haunting that those opening beats tell you right away that this is a story that is not gonna end happily. Director Wallace wanted various connections to the first film, be it obvious ones or more subtle nods, like how the first and second one have their opening credits over a shot of a pumpkin, and in this one it's a digital pumpkin, going along with the movie's theme of witchcraft in the computer age. While the story is moved from Haddonfield, Illinois to Northern California, so still California, you can tell that this has that Carpenter movie feel, as the cinematographer was Dean Cundy, who also shot Escape from New York, The Thing, and The Fog. Anyway, sorry, I think this guy's on the run from something. <laughs> yep, just as I thought. It's Christine! This is Harry Grimbridge, small town store owner, who is finding out the hard way that you do not piss off Patrick Bateman. He will strangle you until you compliment his new set of business cards. Oh boy, this is a stock market crash John Carpenter style. And that's not the weirdest thing to happen tonight. A piece of Stonehenge has gone missing. I'm sure that's not going to play into things later. Nor this. Mm-hmm. You definitely won't hear the silver shamrock jingle 14 times throughout the film. And don't get too close to this man. He just escaped a California lab testing Project Blue. We're all screwed! Luckily, there's a doctor around, but he's a little pissed off. I asked you to thrill me, not soak me, damn you, Lord! Dr. Chalice, played by Tom Atkins, is divorced, realizing it was a bad idea to marry the babysitter in the first place. That's Nancy Loomis from Halloween! You suck, Dad, with these lame-ass plastic masks. No way can they be the killers from Last House on Dead End Street now. Haven't you seen the ad? Eight more days to Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Yeah, 
yes, I've seen the commercial, kids, and I'm about to once again. Eight, four days to Halloween. Turn that down. See, that is why Dad drinks. I gotta call in. Drinking and doctoring, great combination. Yeah, yeah, this is 1982. You can drink and do about anything. Good thing Dr. Chalice is called in, though. Harry's condition is that he's a dirty shoplifter. Just kidding. I don't know why he's here. I mean, unless there's gonna be trouble. There's not gonna be any trouble, is it? I mean, you never know when somebody might be needing help. Oh, right. He attempted to drill a hole in his head after watching the Silver Shamrock commercial too many times. But this old man isn't gonna stop the hospital fun. I think I should have married you, Agnes. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Hades, is that passion on your breath, or is it Coors Light and cigarettes? Anyway, James Spader will put a stop to this. If this actually did take place in the continuity of Halloween 2, perhaps they would learn to have better hospital security. This hospital doesn't even offer a nose job. That's not going to be covered by his insurance. However, the hospital does have a burn unit, even for robot Ben Tramer. Worst part of witnessing all of this, though, explaining it to the ex-wife. No, no, Linda, it's nothing like that at all. If you just relax for a minute, I... The two men died here tonight. You drunken bastard. A murder-suicide is no excuse for you to not take the kids to the arcade. On the plus side, free silver shamrock mask. Those cost a fortune nowadays on eBay. It's good that they remind us it's Sunday the 24th, and not a single one of his robot friends has shown up to move the car. But who does show up? That's Stacy Nelkin is Ellie Grimbridge, Harry's daughter, who is there to identify that the corpse is indeed the rotting remains of the Jerk 2 script. Sure, Dr. Chalice may have seen something disturbing at the hospital, but let's be honest, this morning would have began with booze regardless, and a Halloween tie-in. The Immortal Classic, followed by the big giveaway at 9. That settles it. This movie is taking place outside the continuity of Friday the 13th. And I don't know why he's annoyed at the commercial. He's got to get used to it. It'll play about ten more times in the movie. Anyway, I was told by a moldy brown paper bag in the gutter that I'd find you here, Doctor. Perhaps they should investigate the death themselves. People always try to play detective when they're good and drunk. This is Harry's toy store. It's perfect for the dork who wanted to go as a kid with Frankenstein's monster on his shirt for no reason. Seems Harry was on his way to pick up more masks, but found trouble in Santa Mira, where they make the silver shamrock masks. Dad was always a bastard. He had plenty of time to say who was going to kill him and why, but decided to take a nap instead. Putz. Now let's investigate this shit, but first... Plenty more booze. I love the slow pan to another commercial. The Silver Shamrock theme is so memorable that it's the first thing I think of when I hear the tune. And not London Bridge is Falling Down, which it's a knockoff of, due to London Bridge being in the public domain. There's other great nods, too, like how Santa Mira is named after the town from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Only here, it's a town bought by Tycoon Connell Cochran to turn it into a toy town factory. With the perfect blending of Halloween and St. Patrick's Day, it's like it's the result of an Irish version of the Nightmare Before Christmas plot. There's even state-of-the-art security to make sure no one steps on a church in this town. Dr. Sex and Ellie pose as a couple of buyers, more like a couple of procrastinating buyers. It's almost Halloween. You don't have your masks? Luckily, they find out that not only did her dad stay there, but so did someone named Marion Crane, whoever the hell that is. Here we also meet a Silver Shamrock employee family. Hello, I'm dead, this is my wife dead, and our son very dead. Everyone is showing up at the same time. More procrastinating buyers! He must have been out there listening to people bitch for hours since it's now nighttime. And you know what happens at night. I could sleep in the car. Be better in this floor anyway. Where do you want to sleep, Dr. Chalice? That's a look that says... Is it, is it too early in the movie for a sex scene with someone I barely know? The answer, it's 1982. It's never too early for a sex scene. 
Apparently, the voice announcing the curfew is Jamie Lee Curtis, and she's also the voice of the operator as well. Uh, maybe, but then I see something like this, and suddenly I don't know what to think! So let's compromise and say that the voice is PJ Souls. Eh, whatever. It's Drunk 30, and he's found his own kind in Santa Mira. The movie gets very hardcore into themes about big business and corporations pushing out smaller businesses and firing local employees, like Starker, who has been rendered homeless due to the Silver Shamrock Machine. We'll see what Cochran's corporation has to say about Starker's threats to destroy it. <laughs> And thus, Radio Shack crushed the head of Drunky Starker's Electronics and Goldfish. Oh, they're just pissed because reviews said Michael Myers wasn't in this, but look, there's Halloween 2's Dick Warlock right there! There's a lot of foreshadowing here, like Marge Gutman picking up another order and concerned about the trademark falling off. Oh, kids will just tear that thing off anyway. Or at least they would if they knew what was coming. Meanwhile, the burnt car body is just turning up more ash and mechanical parts. It's a case so confusing, the doctor can't even properly flirt on the phone or in real life. Sorry, I need at least one more can of Billy Beer if I'm gonna properly flirt with about 17 uses of the word bang cream. And you know what will really liven the mood? I was gonna say Barry White, but sure, the Silver Shamrock theme will do. This is right when we find out that the good doctor and Ellie aren't gonna be the only ones shooting a load in the hotel that night. Because the Silver Shamrock label just came. A body double had to be used when actress Garn Stevens didn't want to wear the prosthetic, but huge kudos to the makeup expert Tom Berman, who also worked on The Exterminator, The Goonies, and even the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But now we can finally meet one of the greatest movie villains of all time, Connell Cochran, played by Dan O'Herlihy. A CEO so evil, he wouldn't have just watched Ed 209 shoot a man a thousand times, he would have joined in. Although they are taking Mrs. Gutman to the factory? They're taking her to the factory. She'll weave the most marvelous facility there for emergency treatment. Okay, in fairness, after the events of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, it is a good thing for all factories to also have a medical unit. And just like that, he's off, on his way to torture information out of James Bond with a box of charts. Best we sleep this off, because when we come back, so many people are gonna die right after this. This place was once a funeral parlor, wasn't it? Night of the Demons. The party's just begun. Ready to Now that we're back, let's liven things up with a sitcom family so made for primetime television, the name of the kid is Little Buddy. The Kupfer family is there because Big Buddy sold more masks than anyone in the country. Therefore, we're gonna kill him. What does the person with the least amount of sales get? A vacation? But that still doesn't take away from Cochran being a good businessman. A replacement order is being prepared for you absolutely free. The whole thing's on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, great. We're a day away from Halloween, but sure. Guess we can put them on clearance. Hell, the factory is still making masks, which is smart. If their plan doesn't succeed, it's best that they get a jump start on next year's orders so they can perfect their evil child-killing plan. The movie has fun with the history of toys and practical jokes and how they've evolved, especially with lines like this. Before that, he used to make toys. Oh, remember that? When I had one of those when I was a kid, he used to sit and watch it for hours. Well, the man has... We as a people were desperate for entertainment without TVs back then. Thank God someone came along and created F Troop! The silver shamrock masks used in the movie were created by Godfather of Halloween himself, Don Post, 
with the three masks being called the Halloween Three, like the title! However, in the movie world, the final processing comes in, which is a mixture of Stonehenge and the cave sequence from Temple of Doom. That's why they need bodyguards. Either that, or Connell Cochran is also President of the United States? Here's one of my favorite Cochran moments. When they find her father's car, watch as his face goes from a sweet old man business owner to murderous CEO psychopath. Trade secrets. Good lord, that's a guy who can't wait to turn a kid's head into bugs. After the twelfth shot of tequila of the night, they decide maybe it's best to leave. They can sell masks out of their trunk and make back their gas money. And despite everything else going on, Dr. Chalice still looks like he wants to take an axe to the head of a commercial. If given the choice, you'd probably prefer dealing with a missing Ellie. Oh, great, she's been replaced by Spandau Ballet. Dr. Chalice escapes, but also seems tempted. That looks like the kind of place that would probably serve alcohol. Oh, wish I brought my glasses. He might as well save Ellie. He's not going to go back to a world of sleeping with hospital staff. At this point, he's probably worried that the final processing is a disgruntled employee jerking off into the latex. I love that this factory is so weird that he thinks that must be a real old woman just sitting there in isolation and knitting. Where is she? Where is she? Relax, you can still bang it. The movie's also a commentary on mega corporations preferring to use machines over human employees. But granted, it is easier to get a machine to be a Toy Store Terminator. And unlike humans, machines are filled with delicious banana cream pie. Going back to his expression earlier, this here is the opposite. Now he goes from frightening evil to friendly with brilliant grace. I must try to get a replacement. Ah, Mr. Chalice. See, he seems nice again. He isn't all bad. Sure, he's a villain who has to explain to our hero his evil plan, but that seems very in keeping with Cochrane as a character. This is a dude who relishes in telling someone about the insanity of his plan and his creations. Bless you. Convincing, aren't they? See, the guy created sneezing robots. And if you're wondering how they got Stonehenge all the way to the factory, Cochran's got you. We had a time getting it here. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how we did it. I love it. No need to explain, just know it was crazy. Even when Tommy Lee Wallace gets asked about the lore of the movie, the response is usually, hey, it's magic, man. So, Stonehenge has a power that's like the laser from Top Secret crossed with Freddy Krueger's insect-making ability. Makes sense, it's magic! Cochran loves a joke so much, he brings the Kupfer family in for a demonstration. If Dr. Chalice wasn't there, were they just gonna bring in this family to murder them just for their own shits and giggles? Again, it's perfectly in keeping with the character that the answer would be yes. At least we find out that the big giveaway at 9 is a Blu-ray of The Nest. Still not sure if it's Stonehenge and the mask causing Little Buddy's death, or if that's just naturally what happens after hearing this commercial for the 200th time. <laughs> Nope, definitely Stonehenge. I touched Stonehenge once. That's why I'm a grasshopper now. They're only fainting because finally they have a moment's peace. The bugs will be far less of an obnoxious disappointment than little buddy. As for Dr. Chalice... <laughs> yes, I've reached the ultimate reason to start drinking at 7 in the morning. Leave it to a Halloween movie outside of the Michael Myers continuity to still contain the best Halloween franchise death. And this is only the second most dangerous toy of the 80s. I remember the pogo ball. Speaking of nostalgia, the whole montage of kids getting their masks and trick-or-treating takes me back to when I was a kid. I love that the masks are so popular and so much of a fad that kids are combining them with costumes that don't even call for those masks. 
It takes me back to my own days of trick-or-treating. It just looks like my childhood, more so than any movie in the Halloween franchise. However, I don't think I've ever met a robot. They're covering their tracks too hard. They murder the morgue attendant on the off chance that she'd think the body was a robot. But even if she did, who would believe her? And how would that stop their plan? It's already Halloween. I'll chalk it up to he's drilling a hole in her head because she hasn't seen the Silver Shamrock commercial enough to do it herself. And why is Cochran doing all of this? Why? Do I need a reason? It's like his hatred of children and his appetite for a sick joke is way more important than business. But he does give a bone-chilling speech that adds more to this. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago when the hills ran red. Yep, pants properly shit. He digs deep into a history of human sacrifices to control their environment, as foretold by the planets, whose alignment is telling them that it's time for another big sacrifice. That sounds insane, but O'Hurley oh, sells it. And happy Halloween. And with that, Connell Cochran is a true horror icon. Yet it is still nice enough to let the Doctor's last movie be Halloween. It could be worse. He could have put on Savage Weekend. After 40 takes to get this shot right, the Doctor easily escapes. Perhaps they think that this is just the opening scene from Halloween. I wonder if they had a plan for the big giveaway at 9, if their plan didn't work. Like, well, our human sacrifice didn't work out, so here's a box of Lincoln Logs. Choke on him, you shit-ass kids. Don't forget, though, the night can still get worse. Linda, Linda. Dan, where the hell have you been? Sh sh shut up, sh Linda, shut up. Listen, listen. Because he called his ex-wife. Ugh, I'm gonna go hang out with Cochran. I know how to get seen. Well, he's just not even trying to be sneaky anymore. The logos have a very different effect on the robots. If you play the song and release the labels, it just zaps them to death. Stonehenge is weird! Though we do have one remaining brilliant Cochrane moment. Yes, he has his own bravo clap. He knows he's about to die, but he also knows that that doesn't matter because he's already won. Oh, and then this happens. Why does Stonehenge have the power of Old Testament God? At least the town can now be known for beautifully bleak cinematography. Although, given that Ellie has been turned into a robot, you gotta give her this. At least she waited for her evil side to kick in. It was nice of her to help Dr. Chalice out by killing all of her other robot friends. Plus, after he knocks her head off, he's gonna find some way to mix her blood with vodka and tomato juice. After just one more hand job for the road. <laughs> See, this makes sense when you also know that Tom Berman also did the effects for Oliver Stone's The Hand. Santa Mira is either suddenly not that far from the gas station, or she waited a hell of a lot longer on the trip back to turn evil. But this sets up for a beautifully twisted ending. He calls the TV stations to take the commercial off the air. I guess they believe him enough to do so, at least on a couple of channels. He doesn't tell the kids in front of him to take theirs off because, well, the effects earlier were pretty cool. Even if this particular network doesn't go off. All your kids and all your friends' kids are dead. Game over. Now this may seem ambiguous, but nah, I'm on the side of Chalice Failed. The novelization states that the kids all over are dead. Plus the end credits were supposed to contain the screams of children dying until they thought, well, maybe we'll just leave it ambiguous instead. But that's a local affiliate he's talking to, and the Silver Shamrock commercial is a national commercial. <laughs> Our kids are dead. 
While Halloween 3 did make its money back, it made $14 million and cost $2.5 million, it still didn't perform as well as the previous two, and the reviews at the time were negative, with audiences and critics not digging the fact Michael Myers wasn't in it. So the anthology idea was dropped, and in 1988, we got the return of Michael Myers. And ironically, to me, Halloween 3 is better than any of the Michael Myers movies that came after it. Over time, the movies gained a gigantic audience and critical reappraisal, with more modern reviews being positive towards the film. It's a movie that captures the lore and spirit and feel of the Halloween season, in my opinion, more than a lot of the others in the series. Even the fake commercial is just as iconic as a real seasonal commercial, and definitely captures how many times you see ads like this on repeat during any given holiday. Sure, the movie is full of holes, but along with the fog, it's like the perfect embodiment of a horror story you tell around a campfire with your friends and a flashlight. Not to mention, Connell Cochran is one of the greatest horror villains of the past 50 years. Sure, Michael Myers may kill you and your friends, but Connell Cochran will kill all the world's children, not just for a sacrifice, but for a lark. Halloween 3 is one of those great horror films, not appreciated in its time, but is now a huge part of the season in our home. Watch it this month and give it the love it deserves, or else Stonehenge will turn you into a mantis. Maybe. Probably. Stonehenge is weird! I do love a good joke, and this is the best ever. A joke on the children.